Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Hampton. I'm the director of the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. Welcome to today's Berkeley Book Chat. The Berkeley Book Chats feature a member of the Berkeley Humanities faculty in dialogue about a recently published book. Today, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Annika Lenson of the History of Art Department at Berkeley, talking about her new book, Beautiful Agitation, Modern Painting and Politics in Syria. She will be in conversation with Professor Julia Bryan Wilson, also of the History of Art Department. Let me remind you that our book chat guests will talk for about three quarters of an hour, after which they will entertain questions from our audience. So feel free to use your YouTube chat function to contribute your questions and comments as we go. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to turn things over to our guests and to welcome everyone to the Townsend Center. Thank you so much for that, Tim, and thanks to everyone at the Townsend Center for facilitating this. And thank you most of all to Annika for inviting me to be in conversation with you today about your magnificent, freshly published book, Beautiful Agitation. I have it here with me. Um, I want to open things up by just congratulating you, first of all, on this amazing achievement. It is an incredibly dense, remarkable um, uh, book that I think will be transformative for um, the field of global modernism and more specifically for conversations about painting in Syria, which is the um, territory that you delimit in your title. And I think we'll get into the complications around that um, national description descriptor as we have our conversation today. Thanks, so you, Julia. You. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> So I guess the first thing I want to I want to begin by just acknowledging that I'm not a specialist in the region um, in, that this book is about at the same which is you know broadly speaking what you could call the Arab East it's also called West Asia sometimes but I find your book um, just immensely generative um, for all of our history and for visual studies more broadly not only because of the incredible amount of information that you have packed into the pages. Um, it really is the first time that anyone has attempted to describe the kind of networks of affiliation and training that are um, of the artists that you have chosen, but also in terms of method, of broader methodological questions for the history of art. And I think it's most suggestive perhaps around an issue that I struggle with myself, a challenge really, which is how to put into words a kind of thick description of how politics relates to form or how politics come through artistic form or are sublimated within artistic form. And of course, and you don't, I think, come to any easy answers. Um, you have some speculations and some, you know, uh, you know, by way of conclusions, but I really feel that that's the thing for me that I find is most fascinating and really uh, also is, is such a model. So I think that I just would encourage anyone watching this to buy Annika's book and to read it, even if the um, if modern painting in Syria is not is something that feels like the immediate hook, I would say it has so many lessons on offer for how to um, put to how to put art history into a kind of um, political frame. So thank you for that. Oh, first thank, of all. You. thank you for that. <laughs> so maybe we can pull up the first image. We're going to, you know, in, in true form to our discipline, we're going to structure this around a series of works. I'm just going to slide show here. Sure. And... Right, so this is an image um, which I'd like to hear you say more about, uh, which is of an uh, attack by air on the city of Damascus. And you put, this is in your introduction by way of marking the fact that your own research was inevitably altered um, because of the um, because of the much unrest in Syria. But I also wanted to start here because um, it makes sense to note that the first military action of the Biden administration was a drone attack on Syria um, or within the boundaries of Syria. So I also felt like your book speaks, you know, has spoken to um, you know, it, in a way it tells a story of the unfolding of your own time in Syria, right. which was marked by these struggles, but that it also, you know, it arrives in a world in which those struggles are very much ongoing. Right, yeah. Um, I'll say thank you. And um, certainly the attack <laughs> on targets on the border of Syria and Iraq in the at most at, under Biden in the name of a kind of 
Iraqi security um, does enact a kind of dynamic that the book is tracing of uh, designation of Syria without sovereignty or the sense that uh, for Syria to achieve sovereignty is a threat to other interests. And then Syrian intellectuals own sense that sovereignty may not be the goal, that instead a recognition of a kind of intersubjective interdependency is the truth of the region that would, would be the better uh, kind of political position to claim and to try to claim through cultural production through writing or through painting. So the image on the screen is from 1945 and it's by an artist named Mahmoud Hamad. And uh, Mahmoud Hamad is not a central protagonist in the book, but is a member of the first civic um, art association established by Syrian painters in the anticipated run-up of recognized independence for Syria after French occupation for two decades. So during the Second World War, uh, France itself declared that uh, Syria would be made independent, but kept deferring that as part of their own uh, wartime objectives. And of course, a series of investments in empire that, that they weren't going to give up. And Syrians, uh, artists came together to practice outdoor painting as a kind of skill that was uh, that uh, accrued to a professional artist in that time. And it's really interesting to me that they came together and chose the name of Veronese for their, for their studio. And they chose that not for the Italian artist, but for the color green that was part of the paint sets that they were, uh, uh, that were a kind of prized possession that were hard to get in Syria that, that they had gotten as a marker. And so this idea of pigment as both, uh, you know, a professional metier, but also something uh, that, in its unmediated form is bright and almost artificially bright and signified in particular ways on the canvas is something that Hamad was working with in the couple of years running up to this. And then this is a painting of uh, French planes bombing the parliament building uh, in Syria that they themselves had constructed as a kind of parting shot, not wanting to give up the, uh, their, the, their hold on Syria and only finally withdrew a year later under international pressure because this symbolic act of bombing the parliament was so appalling in the kind of brief moment after the second world war that the US and other power stepped in and, and shifted the balance. So we have an artist not painting live, uh, <clears throat> painting later, I think, uh, staging the scene from the mountain Kassiun in, in Damascus, that's the kind of topography of that place. And what I, I find this an incredibly moving, not like a great painting, but an incredibly moving painting in a lot of ways, including that handling of this orange red, this you know, color that's not a natural color that hovers there and that our artists literally mixes into his other tones to carry that fire to the rest of the city. So it's um, both a kind of naturalistic plain air painting and a, and a deeply symbolic painting trying to figure out what color and fire can do in a, in a composition. So it's a threshold for me. Yeah, and I think throughout the book, you talk about color as a kind of um, catalyzing agent in a way, um, or something, a color as a mediating force between what you describe as a, a kind of reservoir and the surface of the of painting or drawing or watercolor. So maybe we can use this as a threshold itself to turn more substantively to the um, central arguments and claims with the next image where, oh, actually, let us actually go one more further. Sorry, I know this, we're gonna go a tiny bit out of order, I'm sorry, but I, I think this, is a, this gets us to the question of agitation in a more um, legible way, possibly. So this is a, a really interesting image that to me kind of hovers or at the borders of figuration and abstraction, or maybe kind of renders that false binary obsolete. Uh, Dabki, which is a Levantine folk dance um, from 1950. And you've, you've told me actually in private, you know, when we've talked that this has never been reproduced in color before. So it's quite a um, coup for it to be in the 
book. And I think one of the things that, so I, I want to hear about, I guess I want to use this image as a springboard to talk about the concept of agitation, agitation, not only in the political sense in terms of, you know, collective social unrest or even revolution, but also as you use it as spirit or as energy, you taught um, these, some of these artists are drawing from Henri Bergson's notion of vitalism. They are also looking to Leonardo da Vinci, a whole range of sources right. to summon this sense of maybe it's imagination, maybe it's intuition. You, you, you land on the word agitation, um, but it is this kind of life force that is kind of um, underlying things and even is a kind of a, a binder for communities, right? It's something that kind of um, brings people together. And I feel like this surface with its, you know, with all of its brushwork that seems so energetic speaks to that. So it speaks to many levels of agitation at once. So maybe come, like, maybe tell us about that word, you know, and how you came to it. And I know it, it comes partially from the incredible research that you did. I also want to flag that beautiful agitation comes on the heels of this amazing book um, that Annika was one of the co-editors for, Modern Art and the Arab World, the primary documents, MoMA volume, that is this field-changing book, compendium of primary documents. Um, well, well, thank you for calling that out. And uh, yes, the, the book, this book is trying to do a kind of parallel analysis where I do attend to the images that the artists are producing and producing in a context where the audience for that image wouldn't, couldn't always be expected to be like a museum audience or a salon audience, that there are these other communities of reception that are constituted often within a, a recognized political party, for instance, the sort of youth movements or the, the intellectual arm of these uh, larger, uh, corporate efforts to sort of harness energies and that in that setting that the artwork is not viewed as a kind of lineage, a modernist lineage of uh, each new innovation begetting the next. The, these are artists who do not see themselves as operating in a uh, space of um, uh, sort of severed artistic production where art is about other art. They are inspired by that idea of art, but they want art to be about effects. And those are effects that can be recognizable and felt uh, somatically and uh, can be sort of induced and furthered then once these communities are made to sort of open themselves to an artwork like this. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute and then bring that kind of new awareness into other settings. So there's, for me, agitation is in one regard an effort to point to the way that this that artworks are thought to kind of enter into a social space and produce a dissonance with sort of what is already known and what might be possible and for art for and the way i then track that is through decisions of factor like how these things got made and artists relationship to their medium um, and how they can make their medium behave uh, to sort of show or again, further enact agitation. And then never trusting the idea that uh, we can recuperate historical possibility by just responding to ourselves in the present and how we regard artworks. I spent a lot of time trying to track what artists said the effects of the art, uh, artwork uh, were in their uh, writing. So indeed that uh, MoMA book is an effort to collect sort of published statements uh, from artists across the wider Arab world in the 20th century, tracking those possibilities and how they're um, celebrated. I also um, spent time recuperating letters that hadn't been published uh, before, interviews, all to try to uh, confirm my hypothesis that these, uh, these are not autonomous works at the power of them is their kind of effect on the body and, and the heart. For instance, this is a rendering of, of a dance uh, and precisely where we might expect a figure, like a muscle bound fleshly figure, we get an artist tracking uh, with a language of tracery, uh, a kind of the vectors of the movement involved in this collective dancing activity. And then yes, these wild brush marks 
uh, and I have all of these great letters by these artists that are talking about, um, you know, Van Gogh and uh, the like, the sort of impasto touch that is a kind of sadness or anxiety, which they don't see, they only see in poor reproduction. So the, you know, the dimensionality of the brushwork is a kind of guesswork that uh, Ed Hemis Mail here is using to set that down as one level of agitated texture. And then the kind of a smooth choreography of dancing together in this setting is traced atop that. And then we get these hints of the red, unmixed red, orange and yellow as another kind of input thought to um, agitate sensory states in another way. So we have this layering of, right. of that uh, imagination. Do you know, what are, what are the dimensions of this? I don't know. Uh, so in acquiring this, I'd only seen it reproduced in black and white in a 1965 uh, booklet produced for this artist by his brother uh, when he passed away. And through a friend in Syria, I learned where it was, but not much about the owner. And this is a shout out to our wonderful librarian, Mohammed Hamid, who helped me WhatsApp the owner. Uh, so my Arabic, I can like pass as a 75 year old person who'd been educated <laughs> <laughs> in like bath party uh, school, I have this like a no slang whatsoever. So I, I can't charm anybody who's any younger than that. And Mohammed helped me with my hit, hitting the right tone to see if the owner uh, would be willing to send an image. And we did ask about the surface and the dimensions, but the owner didn't, the owner gave permission to reproduce, but stopped re responding. So I don't have all the information about this. Well, what I love about, I mean, there's so many things to say about it. One of which is, as you noted, the kind of calligraphy of the marks here um, and how they register not only that they produce a kind of optical vibration, but also they're meant to enliven, you know, your sense of being a body in community with other bodies. But also Dobke, I know has kind of uncertain etymology, but um, one way that people understand that word is coming from an Arabic term meaning stomping feet on the ground or something like that. And here they're, you know, what is what is the ground here? Are they floating? Yes. There's the sense that the gravity yeah, has been suspended in some sense. Precisely. And then the brushwork, right? The little, the, the, just the physical choreography of going in and hitting the sort of rhythmic point uh, here. So the, the idea of notation is of um, great interest to Ed Hemismail and there are even traces here that start to resemble Arabic writing, like uh, sawed here, it looks like. And he was operating in an intellectual universe uh, where the ideas of Zaki Arsuzi about the Arabic language being naturally motivated rather than absolutely arbitrary. Uh, and Arsuzi actually tracked sort of the sounds of, uh, of Arabic rather than the like trilateral letters. He was interested in phonemes Hmm. and linked it to natural phenomena. So another way to read this is the landscape speaking uh, itself and sending that kind of motivated language into uh, a body again. So we have to be carriers for this existing language that will find expressions in other uh, vessels. Fascinating. So maybe let's go back to the Gibran and talk a little bit about how the crucial role um, played by, perhaps surprisingly, played by Khalil Gibran in your book, who of course in this country is very well known as a crossover poet. I mean, one of the most highly public, I mean, probably one, the prophet of course, like widely, widely, widely in circulation. And what, uh, what you're doing in your book is actually making the case for him also as a visual artist, but not just that, but also as someone, a kind of key progenitor to the questions of agitation and form and um, spirit that you're trying to put, put under pressure. So this is a really, I mean, the, the works here, I mean, let's just say it, they're totally weird. I think <laughs> they're really weird. This is an image <laughs> of a hand holding this flickering flame. I mean, we've traveled together um, we, to this museum. Um, Annika was, uh, we went, we had a really amazing field trip together um, as colleagues and friends to this uh, museum that's in the kind of hills of Lebanon, uh, very interesting institution. 
to see some of these in person because in fact, they're very difficult to reproduce. And you talk about in the description, a kind of homunculus figure that's pretty hard to see, I will say in the reproduction. And I think part of the point you're making is that for Gibran, the, these kinds of pools of liquescence are actually, they're very, the formlessness actually of what he's doing um, has something to do with what he sees as the traffic between drawing and photography and the idea that things, images are developing out of these inchoate right. matters. Um, he was a pr protege of the photographer F. Holland Day, which is its own, you know, which you talk about and it's its own fascinating chapter. Um, but maybe to focus on this image, we can talk a little bit more about the idea of the artist almost as a kind of medium figure right. through whom some of these energies are being channeled and pouring forth. Right, thank you for that, that question. And um, because you'd kindly foreshadowed an element of it might be asked. I did return to the um, sort of textual surround here that I was pointing to as part of my method. And, you know, Gibran was an important later discovery in writing this book. The Gibran chapter is the last one I wrote, but the first in the book and the, and the earliest. And um, yeah, I turned to Gibran because so many of, so Ed Hem Ismail, whose painting we were just looking at and Fetheh El Mudaris and other artists, artists in Iraq in the forties were when, when they turned to publish their own uh, cultural material were citing Gibran a lot. I mean, he remained there as this Arab symbolist who um, had a model of what art was supposed to do exactly to your question, Julia. And I found this little scrap of paper in the Sumaya Museum in Mexico City in their online archive, I didn't go in person, whereas Gibran had actually written a description of uh, Jesus Christ as a universal prophet in this longer line of bodies being messengers for versions of spirit and had written about the prophet as being a person who tosses pebbles into a lake and whose metier is not marble or paint, but the human heart. And in the stirring of that reservoir <laughs> uh, brings power to the sort of uh, others clustered on its exterior who feel um, this kind of wave of agitation. And for Gibran, this holy flame fits into a you know, theosophical, uh, 19th century ideas of being reborn, but it's also really crucial to him that the flame, you know, burns away paper uh, and releases something. And yeah, there's so, that kind of like creation out of destruction or- Precisely. Creation. Yeah. And that's how, it, that's how the ground is prepared to link to uh, Bergson, who comes a little later in the intellectual lineage for, for the artists I'm looking at, it's the 30s where Bergson um, is really, activated for Arab intellectuals, which is maybe slightly later than how Bergson's often talked about for French intellectuals. Um, and Bergson's one uh, opposition to photography as trying to exert these still frames on the world. Uh, and th that will um, just give us a false sense of the actual organic duration of ourselves. That was really important and understandably so to figures living in a colonial setting where measurements are by planes, <laughs> taking photographs, uh, the sort of ID card, everything that we've studied about uh, colonial, settler colonial uh, modernity, uh, Bergson offered a way out. And Bergson of course also suggests that life subsists beyond an individual. And for, for Gibran, this sense of demonstrating that through a kind of destructive relationship to the paper. When we went, when Julia and I went together to the museum, I thought we would have this amazing experience seeing the original works on paper so we could see how the paper and the like suspension of ink were behaving, but they all of the originals had been taken away and been replaced by these huge reproductions that were all wrong. I had a panic attack. I thought that, I thought like none, all the originals had disappeared from the world or something had been sold on into auction, but we tracked them down later and to see how he lets the paper almost dissolve in, in these drawings that for him were finished drawings that he sold, that he donated, um, I think is really instructive both for him and his power for the artists that came later. 
they were also thinking about creation through destruction. Right, and it's so, I mean, it's really important for your argument that though the word painting is in the title of your book, a lot of the materials you're looking at are really refuting that as a category. And some yeah. of these, you know, I mean, this is the work on paper. I mean, it, wouldn't, it doesn't always automatically fit into the kind of, you know, vaunted category, hegemonically consolidated category of painting, you right. know, many Euro-American histories of modernism with a capital M. Right. But you really make the claim that this is, you know, that those questions of, I guess, medium specificity are, were really irrelevant in this, you know, in the moment that you're looking at and in the region that you're looking at. I think yeah. there's something too about this particular image or most of these Javon images so strange with their, you know, rock into flesh into ether. I mean, the sense of the kind of permeability of um, life and, um, and, and objecthood or something. I mean, I don't know, I guess I'd love to hear you elaborate um, more on what, how this, you know, what are we actually really looking at in terms of what is the form from which the hand is emerging? Are we not supposed to know? Are we supposed to know? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I fully uh, cracked the case, but this is where his training as a photographer does seem crucial to me. The uh, sort of, so Fred Day staging these pictorialist tableau with costumes and the like, but thinking a lot about how light uh, can produce coal mine effects where the eye actually feels dazzled uh, when confronting the photograph. I think was those kinds of thoughts about how leaving an aperture open and then uh, movement not actually being captured as a sequence in the kind of stutter step cinematic sense, but instead deepening uh, and becoming cloudy, that is a, that's really an aesthetic that uh, Gibran thinks about, writes about in um, chases and in, in these kinds of uh, drawings. So I did call this a homunculus and it's true. You can't see a bot. It's not like a little miniature body. Uh, I felt emboldened to call it that in the writing in the book for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Gibran is I'm sure all people listening are seeing, I hope like Rodin here, right? He, he was, he's really interested in that extension of the hand, but an idea of creation, almost fractal-like where the hand comes out of smaller bodies in a kind of recursive sequence. And um, Gibran did some cartoons for newspapers that actually enacted that idea. And uh, Julie, I don't know if you remember, but remember when I suddenly got a, a call when we were in Lebanon and I got to go see a collector's uh, sketchbook, yeah. mysterious yeah. Uh, collector's sketchbook. And that was a, a helpful visit because there are actually some sketches by Gibran where he has drawn figures, whited them out on the paper, painted over them with these kinds of clouds in a similar visual idiom here. And of course, not only does he do these originals on paper, he was constantly rendering the images into uh, grayscale reproductions that accompanied his schmaltzy poetry that uh, circulated all around the world. And so he's, uh, he often is playing with this kind of opposing orange and blue color scheme that then gets rendered into a kind of sameness in grayscale and then circulates and get, can be pulled back out and recolored. So I'm, I'm also interested in the kind of paleness of the palette uh, that seemed to be a part of these ideas that- um, Yeah, so different if we put that next to the, um, the flames, the orange of the flames oh. of the, the, pre, the image that we started with. Yes, you know? right. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, so maybe though, let's um, go forward to the Ismail Porter, which is another really central figure for your arguments. Um, there's so much to say about this and you have said much already in not only in your book, but also in the kind of a, a very a signature article that was published that circulated around this image and its reception and the idea of the era, the contested idea of the arabesque. And I guess one thing, to, there's so much, like I said, there's so much to say, but one of them is that in this chapter, I mean, pro, you kind of progressively in your book, you, the idea of Syria gets progressively more consolidated, I guess, right? Or like, um, and in this chapter, you're thinking about an artist who's trying to evoke more of a kind of Arab collectivity, or that's in some kind of conversation, often yeah. a kind of tense conversation with Syrian citizenship. So right. those things are actually disarticulated, you know, and right. only sometimes overlap. 
And here, I think one of the fascinating things about this image is not only what people described as the arabesque um, nature of the continuous line, but also the rendering of modernity. And of course the word modern is also in your painting. And, and I, I like that it you know, indicates both modernism, but also moder you know, modernization. So here is the um, rapid urbanization happening. But, and what we're seeing, however, is kind of the oldest form of underclass exploitation, which is a man hauling materials up a mountain. So there's nothing to do here with kind of like a beautiful technical um, uh, progressiveness, you know, or like right. a sense that, that, that modernization has brought any sort of relief into, you know, the, those who really bear the burden of this kind of work. So I know that's a lot of things to say. Yeah. Just one thing, what, let, maybe we can talk about the word modern here, you know? Sure. Modern. Yeah. What modern was important to you or what modern was, what kind of modern was important to these artists? Right. Yeah. No, thank you for that question. And I mean, this is another hideous painting. Uh, and, and the artist meant it that way. I mean, this is, an, this is, this is Ed Hem Ismail who painted Dubki. This is not hideous. I find this, I mean, it's peculiar, but it has a, a kind of uh, brightness. This is uh, to produce anxiety in the face of a uh, very personal rendering by Adhem Ismail of the uh, condition of the underclass in um, Damascus, as, as Julia was saying. Um, what allows me to get a lot of mileage out of this painting and thinking about uh, different categories of the modern is that uh, Adhem Ismail put this, did, did, this is a public painting painted to be displayed at the uh, national salon that the um, Syrian government was sponsoring. And it's in 1951. So there had only been, there had been the first one in 1950. This is the second of, uh, of the government's foray into um, sponsoring a, a sort of platform for values to be adjudicated by skilled juries. And Ismail knew all of that uh, and, with his colleagues uh, and members of the um, Bath Party constituted in the name of a kind of revival uh, and recovery, um, I think really fretted about art getting uh, rendered into that kind of um, exhibition idiom. So, you know, modern in that regard is the um, impulse to always equate the kind of best production with a, a nation state patron that um, that was so palpable because it was a condition of, of the French colonial um, position there. The, the whole idea of the mandate was that the populace was getting trained to be citizens in a proper uh, nation state. And then the, the government takes that over and Ismail puts this in. And the um, way then that I, I've settled on reading it is, as I said, it's, it's supposed to be difficult to view. The eye doesn't settle on what Ismail has traced. And Ismail is tracing, as, as Julia, you just said, this figure of a body bearing the burdens of the uh, modernist enterprise of others. In this case, a kind of um, Abu Ramani suburb that was getting constructed for the well-to-do that, that were sort of extending uh, further in Damascus that, that was under construction in 51. And so Ismail traces that labor and in the process dissolves it. And so we, we do see another kind of modern art debate for Syrians, which is the, the naturalist versus the purely formalist. And, and this takes both sides and in the process shows the, a, a kind of incompatibility that I think um, Ismail is really interested in and uh, sees this as color trying to be free <laughs> by dissolving what's what's like hemming it in. And, but and the it, colors are so strange, right? I mean, they're, the muddiness, but that isn't quite the earthen, I don't know. I mean, there's something, I actually looking at it anew right now and look with the date, I get there is something mid-century about these mm. the color palettes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, you know? And, and I mean, really, I'm actually talking about almost in like the design world. Right. That, 
Right. You mean this like plasticine sort of yeah. thinky? Uh, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. And, and I mean, an element in all of the research is to think about what paint was available, what artworks looked like in reproduction, because that's how everyone was viewing them. And this produces a, a vivid sort of uh, colorscape uh, where artists are in conversation with what they're looking at in journals that, uh, you know, sort of heightened contrast and the like, and I think uh, do play a role in, in how um, Ismail then situates his color choices. Uh, to the point on the arabesque, I mean, it's such a, that is a real site of political debate for Ismail because the word arabesque uh, supposes that there's an Arab origin, but arabesque is not an Arabic word. There isn't, so that, so to write it in Arabic is either to go with the actual Arabic notion of a dancing line to like call it rakash or something, or to transliterate the French uh, back into Arabic, uh, in which case then the idea of the Arab is not, is like rendered with an aleph instead of an ayn, and it just becomes a kind of weird nonsensical call out to an idea of an ethno-national origin. And so Ismail and his, and his cohort are really interested in that, and they don't always use the term arabesque, but they are thinking through what others are claiming the arabesque is about. And there's just this fascinating effort to like, re-embody an externalized category or insist on its expansion or its dissolution in, in the dancing line. The, who they really took affinity with is like Paul Clay, mm -hmm. much more than uh, the sort of artists that were like Matisse uh, to whom the arabesque was attributed by French critics in the same moment. Well, maybe that's a good moment to go to our, the image that we might oh. This one. Clued on, um, because I think the question of automism comes up. I mean, is there, it was already present, but the idea of automatic writing and the role of the unconscious becomes very important for this artist. Um, and you talk about, um, who also made a series of inkblot paintings. But I wanted to conclude um, this, our part of the conversation with this image, because it's, um, in part because it gestures towards your next project. Um, I think that's right, that you're working on sand, you're continuing to work on sand. Right, so I, I guess one, is that not true? <laughs> that's gonna be my third. <laughs> kind of project, so I, knew there's some I recently had an epiphany, but yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the thing to say here, um, there's many things to say here. This is a, a piece that um, Annika reads with characteristic nimbleness, but also, at, and that it's important to know that there is sand embedded in the pigment here, and that is not visible, but was very important to the artist, in part because sand had all of these different national registers for him as, you know, Syria as a kind of desert landscape, etc. And I think it's really important that maybe we hear more from you about the idea of what is perceptible to the eye versus what kind of, um, versus what it's not, you know, what are, I, I guess it's really, it's interesting to me was hearing you talk about how you, in a kind of panic, you like took an emergency trip to Abu Dhabi to confirm, <laughs> you know, that there was in fact sand here, but you actually couldn't see it. I, I don't know, maybe say something about how the invisible versus the visible was important, not only uh, theoretically for these artists, but also, you know, that ramifies into how we approach these materials now. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I did make that confession. I mean, I love writing about, painting so much, sometimes I convince myself things are there that uh, that I invented through the writing. So this was one, then I go, you know, one, one must go back and confirm and can think. And uh, that's another reason why I also try to so assiduously bring in the testimony of, of the audience for this painting itself. So yeah, I, I did go to Dubai uh, and ask the Atassi Foundation to pull it one last time and squinted looking for the sand. So this is, so this is Fateh al-Mudaris and um, it is the final chapter in the book. And Mudaris is a, a important figure. He's actually the artist I've been writing about the longest uh, and with the most difficulty. This is a, this is a tough artist who um, lived a long time, had a lot of sort of acolytes and, um, and in interviews and in his own work, 
was a total contrarian, didn't agree. You know, anytime somebody said, I think your work does this, he would say, no, it doesn't. So a kind of a classic uh, formation. And uh, in the early days when I used to show this painting in, um, in lectures, I promise I'll be efficient with my answer here, but I would, um, it had the title, The Last Supper by the Atassi Foundation. And it was really interesting to me if we read this as The Last Supper that uh, for one, the apostles are women that are marked with these cartoonish circular breasts that then to the sort of uh, point we were exploring with Edhem Ismail, the, the kind of nature that expresses itself through bodies, then we start to see all these, this, it's a sort of joke about circles and X's there, you know, you, the, you know, uh, sex characteristics are marked or not. And so we have the central figure who's cursed to death with a big cross through him. So the uh, figure of the Messiah is also the figure of kind of the lack of these breasts. And then we have the circles all over the uh, landscape in the sort of last meal and the like. So um, my daughter has played a lot with sort of producing a body through an ink blot or a soaking expansion and then going back in and placing these sorts of sex characteristics, crowns, uh, marks of power as incidental kind of later um, um, sproutings. And so sand is important for that th critical thinking about the body or the idea of the figure. It, even though we don't see the sand per se, we see a agitated surface that's, yeah. you know, a crude We, grain, we see it, a texture media. that has some grain, you know? Yeah, exactly. But the fact that it is sand isn't so clear, but sand has particular desiccating properties as a surface. So the sense that the later over articulation of bodies gets sort of immediately sucked down into that surface is really important for um, Mudaris and for any model of painting, which is what I'm tracking through the whole book, where what we see has come up from below. Mm -hmm. rather than being sort of uh, imposed from above, that, that these are planes that are meant to capture a momentary possibility of movements that are going to go and aggregate in other ways. It's also interesting to me, I found finally a clipping, this is why I became panicked, I found a clipping in, the, in a Syrian journal, El Ma'arifa, where this had been reproduced in grayscale and had a different title. And the title was Family in the Open Air. And I thought, oh my God, you know, what if it's not, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not uh, Christ at all. Although uh, it's still meaningful that so many people saw that in, in this painting and uh, Mudaris often painted Christ. But then I thought, you know, open air, how fascinating. Then sand mm, right. has spread across the sky, seals everything still into this kind of shared airless space. Um, where things come up and go back down. And that seemed um, helpful for the other things that Mudaris was doing in 1962, uh, for sure. <laughs> well, if um, we're welcome to take, uh, I, I think it's time to open things up to the audience if there's questions from the audience, but while people are gathering their thoughts, I'll ask you to elaborate a bit on, um, well, I just, as a side note, Annika and I have shared this uh, video interview with Derrida, where he's complaining about how Americans always ask him to elaborate on things he's published. So it's kind of a keyword in our, <laughs> anyway, so, but that is what the format requires. Will you please elaborate on um, how this work fits into what you describe as a kind of international reception of surrealism? And surrealism is actually an interesting touchstone for several, yeah. several moments. Maybe say a little bit more about how these artists were thinking about the relationship between, you know, the reality and the dream world. Or I mean, that's one yeah. way to describe yeah. surrealism, although that's very flawed. That's very um, that's a very flattening way to think about it. Well, no, thank you for that. Um question, I'd love to elaborate on it. As an American, <laughs> I expect to be asked to elaborate. Um, so Mudaris, uh, yes. Syrian uh, reception of surrealism is really interesting. And Mudaris is present uh, in, in that history from the 1940s onward where uh, Mudaris grew, grew up in Aleppo. Uh, and moves to Damascus only in the 60s and has uh, then kind of uh, 
crowd in Aleppo uh, that is more literary than uh, visual and come out of a self-described symbolist uh, literary lineage. And in the early 40s, uh, read in English language journals circulated by the allied troops that are present in uh, Damascus, uh, read about surrealist poetry and painting uh, in its own kind of expanded symbolist register and also as a mode of um, creative production that's been displaced from one center by war and sort of sent, uh, sent around the world. And that's a very powerful narrative of uh, life subsisting and, and human carriers for a worlded, uh, creativity is um, being able to catch those sorts of waves of, of perception and um, repressed truths from uh, any setting. The distinctive element of Mudaris's reception of, of a kind of uh, automatist practice where you're uh, pulling um, truthful material up from below um, that I think is really important in this particular painting is that Mudaris was really attentive to the kind of ethnographic uh, strand of surrealism that was interested in uh, the structuring of human society, uh, not only around kind of repressive norms, but also around, for instance, a drive to sacrifice. So a, a Georges Bataille uh, kind of uh, strand of overproduction where, there, where uh, creative energies get scapegoated and sublated in, in um, acts of sacrifice. And actually, you know, where the Biden sanctioned uh, bombing took place is near the site of Mari, the ancient Mesopotamian civilization that during French sort of colonial archeology, span all of these readings of the excavated city uh, pointed to precincts where child sacrifice by, was thought to occur. And there are these poems about uh, the sacrifice of, of uh, vulnerable members of society. And for Mudaris, that was a, a human um, civilizational inheritance of this cyclical drive to bloodshed in order to um, usher in the next phase of renewal. And, and he read that in a, a surrealist mode, the sort of what we do at night in order to enable uh, continuation in the day. And for him then, uh, a kind of sandy field of, of excavated and buried uh, desires is, is a, a surrealist trope that's also a kind of testimony to, a, yeah, the, the barbarous uh, documents of, of a civilizational history um, that they were living, but they knew um, Syrian society uh, as in the cradle of civilization had also sort of enshrined. And that's, you know, that's a real double edged legacy. Mm -hmm. Syria, the site of all the world's heritage, but also Syria, the site of ritualized um, sacrifice. And uh, I think a lot of his works have that. And, and uh, he spoke to that, he wrote uh, short yeah, And it seems like Mudaras is the, the artist in your, of, of your case studies who's grappling with Syrianness the most. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have several ex excellent questions from the audience. Um, so let's move to that. Here's a, a question that says, you've presented works from museums, from foundations, from non-Syrian spaces, from private collections. Um, could you talk a bit about the networks of circulation for this work? Is it different than it might be elsewhere? Yes, thank you. And thanks for noticing that. I always carefully mark uh, the uh, collections because it is such a um, yeah, structuring a uh, set of facts about access, right? So um, the most potentially distinctive element of how these works were uh, collected, um, I, would, I would venture to say, having, having been um, tracking the flow of Syrian works for a while now, and actually Julia pointed this out, in the end, a lot of uh, the images I chose to highlight and to read are ones that were not collected, that stayed in private collections. So there's a 
interesting parallel track here um, from 1963 onward uh, in Syria when after the uh, coup that brought the Ba'ath Party to power and the Ba'ath Party ostensibly remains in, in control now. Uh, the government implemented surrealist, surrealist, I wish, <laughs> socialist schemes to support artists, um, which again is sort of double-edged. Uh, what it meant was that on an annual basis, artists that were recognized as important. So uh, at Hem Ismail until his, his early death in 64 and Mudaris for all of his career could count on um, their work being purchased. So still today, there are a lot of um, paintings that were exhibited in the national exhibitions and the sort of recognized permitted exhibitions that are in warehouses that the um, government collected. And uh, I got to see some of those and a lot I didn't. And what's interesting about that collecting practice is there was no commitment to exhibition. The, it's the sale that supported the artist, not the uh, exhibition. And the economy was largely controlled. So it wasn't like the paintings accrued in value in, in the way that we might imagine telling art histories closer to the market. So there's that element, and then, um, and I know I don't have so, too much time, but I'll also say then from about 2000 onward, uh, there uh, was permission to, for galleries representing Syrian artists to enter the sort of world contemporary market. So then a lot of works that had been in private collections went to auction and those were acquired by um, some of the um, institutions that you saw on my slide. So there's a really, uh, you know, art history is a fascinating field because we are re relatively close to the market, like closer, I think, than uh, maybe English or Complet. I'm sure anybody working there would, would disagree. But, you know, if I write about an artist or I, if I render an Edhem Ismail into a book and whoever owns that work, the work is, becomes much more valuable because then it, it has a kind of provenance and can be sold at auction. So there's been a flurry of um, auction house sales around the construct of the Middle East and sometimes around um, contemporary Islamic art that has, that has definitely driven the further distribution of these works sort of outside the country uh, elsewhere. But for all of the history that I'm writing, um, Syrians had to leave Syria all the time, driven out for political beliefs for, for economic uh, reasons. And so it's not as if this patrimony was sort of recently liquidated. It's just been accelerated. And the idea of patrimony is really interesting. I started with Gibran for that reason as well. He like never lived in what we now think of as Syria, but was um, making all these decisions in the name of Syria. And that's a dynamic in the book, throughout the book. Another question uh, from the audience is that you've spoken several times about symbolism, both its literature and in the context of Gibran. Can you say more about that? Yes, and I wish I could say even more. This was a real conundrum for me. This, uh, so the, I'm trying to organize how to say it. So yes, in multiple ways. So when I was citing symbolism, I was especially talking about this uh, sense in modern Arabic letters. So poetry and uh, short story writing symbolism uh, in the 30s, for instance, in Egyptian journals and also in Syrian journals was really sort of introduced as a mode of uh, writing that was distinctive and new and a component of modern literature breaking with uh, a variety of obligations of the use of language from before. So it's a very modernist, I mean, as in a world history of symbolism and thinking of sort of uh, Latin American letters and the like, this sort of break with what the word can do and an interest in rearranging words around uh, emotional states. This was really important in letters. And what I found were uh, records of artists thinking about what the equivalent might be for an image, how to break down one set of obligations uh, to constructing an image and, and, and place it into a, a register of emotion. And interestingly, in Aleppo, at least, uh, the, um, the kind of the 
the guy's name is Orhan Mayasar. He's like the, the leader of that group. He kept pronouncing the efforts failures. <laughs> so it was a real struggle for visual artists to come up with a technique that wouldn't, uh, that would allow for ambiguous imagery, that would allow for multiple responses. And the sense that an image might produce multiple responses was one way to test a kind of modern art. This was something that critics talked about all the time. A diversity of response meant that this was a, a modern uh, work. So symbolism as uh, accruing with it, these uh, multiple possibilities of emotional states was a really uh, aspirational model for artists uh, at the same time that they felt that uh, they had to grapple with the specificity of trying to make an image that uh, still had all these conventions it had to draw on in order in order to convey something to audiences. We have time, I think, uh, for maybe one more question, and we still there's still some some really interesting questions in the um, chat, so it's hard to choose. But I guess I'll we can maybe end with one from Catherine Brune. Uh, I was wondering if you might say a bit about how you view the international or global applicability of your engagement with agitation as a frame for viewing artistic production in other geographic or political contexts at this time. Thanks for that question, Katie. Hi. <laughs> um, I think that what I hope that the book contributes, maybe I'll start in a, in a narrow sense, is a set of, uh, and thank you, Julia, for that compliment of just, you know, relatively close readings of decisions by individual makers who are operating in a modern artistic context where nobody imagined either before these artists started or going forward that the genealogy of art is supposed to culminate in an oil on, like an oil paint on canvas painting. <laughs> that the, that they, they knew that the privileged format in a, in a larger setting of a kind of imperial drive by France and other empires, that that, that presumption was present there. But the sense of what art could do, what an image is, how a painting appears and what it's con what medium it's constituted through. If we have Gibran talking about the human heart being the medium to constitute uh, an image, we have, uh, um, you know, Ismail working on through rhythm. Um, those are points of uh, sort of stepping outside a progressivist idea of, of medium that I think are held in common by artists all around the world. Uh, I talk in the book in the second chapter, which doesn't have a main protagonist about artists who went to Paris in the interwar period and thought about prophecy and thought about rhythm and thought about that in a milieu where, um, you know, Senghor is also there asking those questions about how to escape from a Cartesian idea of, uh, of presence that begins from sort of thinking and then rendering thought into something visible. I think that um, then tracking how that sense that the format is constantly reconfigurable, trying to track that back into actual decisions about practice, I'm hoping that that will be uh, resonant and movable um, uh, to scholars working elsewhere where, where the exact same conditions don't obtain, but this sense that it doesn't ever have to be oil on canvas and that uh, doesn't have to be the investment that uh, uh, audience makes and doesn't have to be the investment uh, sponsoring government makes. I think that that's very freeing and I wish we would do that for you know American art. <laughs> I know, for French art. I actually don't even think everybody, you know, even the supposed hegemonic powers. I, I think very few practitioners thought that way. Everyone worked across applied and fine arts. Everybody thought about um, aesthetic categories across media. And that's our actual 20th century modernist heritage that will free up ways to think about art and free up ways to think about art politically. Well, Annika, we're out of time. And I wanna thank you once again, not only for this wonderful conversation, but for your truly fantastic game-changing book that really is something that was such a pleasure to engage with for some years <laughs> on my end. I have really enjoyed seeing it progress and change shape. It's such a different book than your dissertation was so many years ago. And it's really so incredibly strong and compelling and um, beautiful in its own way. And thank you again to the Townsend Center and thank you to everyone who watched.
Yeah, thank you. <laughs>